everyone at home very likely has some children somewhere in their life that they can be a part of that child's life. And, and in bringing that ecological awareness and, and spiritual sense of like interbeing and raising good kids, we all have a really effective mechanism in which to interact with the world that is probably undersold the most. I think people talk, oh, don't drive cars and eat no meat. I think like being be engaged in a young child's life, I think has a way more impact uh, and it's way more fun. It's way more fun than not flying, you know? Welcome to The Regeneration Will Be Funded. I'm your host, Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're having conversations about regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. How can we build an economy that's in service to life? Brought to you by Ma Earth. You can find all of our conversations at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Today's conversation is with my brother, Brian Monahan, also known as BMO. Brian is an amazing husband, father, son, entrepreneur, philanthropist, farmer, poet, and all around incredible human being. I'm very lucky to call him a brother. We are very close. We lived together for many years in California, and we now live together in community in Aotearoa, New Zealand. As you'll see in this conversation, Brian exudes a playful humor, but he's also a very deep thinker and has a real gift at articulating the simple essence to important ideas. This conversation was really an introduction, kind of a sampler of the many topics that Brian is interested in. We discuss things like our upbringing, business, technology, uh, poetry, raising kids, burnout, AI, and so much more. This was also the first conversation that we recorded in our new media space, uh, which we touch on in the discussion as well. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Brian Monahan. Welcome. Today we are here with Brother Bimo yeah. in the house yeah. at our first ever recording yeah. in this new space, uh, which used to be a garage and it's gotten all tricked out. Place looks great. Big props to you and the whole team for putting it together. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for being the inaugural guest. Yeah. Good to be here. We've had one heck of a journey together. Mm-hmm. You were just telling your daughter Aurora mm. the other day that You've known Fafa, what she calls me, mm. uh, your entire life. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, yeah, since since birth and seeing, you know, my two daughters together, similar age gap as us, I can see just what a foundational relationship it is for them, even before they remember it, you know? Mm. And so, like, even before I've known you, you were in my life, even before I can remember. Mm-hmm. And actually, a lot of those early years, so much is built about our understanding of the world and who we become before we can even remember it. Mm -hmm. I think it's trippy. So yeah, like our relationship is even past my memory. Amazing. Yeah. And I can't wait to talk more about what it's like to be a father. Mm. I'm learning so much from witnessing you on this journey and it's so much fun. Mm. But before we go there, I would love to start from the beginning of your childhood Mm. and maybe share a bit about your, your background, our background, if you will. It was a little strange to give our background uh, <laughs> on your behalf. Um, well, let's see. We grew up on the, the banks of, of the Mississippi River Delta, really, in southern Illinois, in a small little community called Murfreesboro, about 10,000 people. And, uh, you know, our, our mom was a, a school teacher and, and uh, a homemaker. And our dad worked as kind of in sales and general contracting and odd jobs. And it was like academics and school and focus and achievement in that respect. Mm -hmm. Never much for the sports fields and, uh, you know, that world. So I think we both hit the books hard and and did the university thing. Um, There were a lot of sports in our life. Uh, We just weren't necessarily very good at them. Yeah, I just didn't make the team. I, I tried out. I tried out. I remember seventh seventh grade baseball team. Uh, I, I tried out for the sport and went through the whole 
thing. And then the last day, there were only two stu- students who didn't make the team. <laughs> it was like 30 kids, 28 of them make the team. And I was one of the two that, that got the cut. And they, but they felt bad yeah. for like Nixon. Mm. And so they said, well, you could travel with the team and still be part of the team as the team statistician. <laughs> And that was like appropriate. I had I to keep the, the little logs and at every play I would record and I had all these statistical models and didn't help for meeting any girls. But, <laughs> but at least I got to be one of the boys and, and go travel. And we actually won the state championship that year. So nice. I think it was because my rigorous statistical yeah, analysis. exactly. For the sure. money ball. The money yeah. ball. Exactly. I'm Jonah Hill, the little fat kid. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So a, a rigorous academic upbringing, yeah. uh, relatively speaking. I mean, it was a public public schooling system, but mom had us in the library a lot yeah. and just kind of always pursuing that. You were a math whiz. Yeah. Uh, beyond the statistician, you were also doing state math competitions. And yeah. um, I remember a picture of you from, yeah. you, you were a, a, an all-time star at the Scholastic Bowl. You had like all of these achievements and certifications and you would win all of the, yeah. the competitions and yeah. Yeah, I was a beast in the trivia competition modes, <laughs> for sure. The little buzzer was like Jeopardy. Right. You'd buzz in and you'd have to answer questions. And yeah, I was really good at that. Yeah, yeah. really important yeah. life skills. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't remember anything now. I lose my keys. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was really a cool experience, though, because that and things like uh, Key Club, which is a junior version of Kiwanis, mm-hmm. were these opportunities at a young age to, to get exposure and opportunities for leadership or to succeed. Mm-hmm. And I, I really am thankful for that in our school because while we didn't have like a great academic school or whatever, mm-hmm. we did have a, a small town community that cared about us and that wanted to see us succeed and wanted to create opportunities for success that the small town itself couldn't provide. Mm-hmm. And I think our parents did that. I mm-hmm. think that the school did that, like Mr. Hall and Ms. Tate and mm-hmm. the counselors and all of that did that for us. And um, yeah, created a tremendous opportunity. Um, so for like for me to, to leave the Murfreesboro and go to Harvard University, essentially on a full ride scholarship was just a kind of an inconceivable uh, opportunity you mm-hmm. know, for, for kids from where we were. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, I had gone off to California mm. and dropped out of school. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, kind of trying to impart my uh, internet marketing lessons and wisdom <laughs> on you while you were at Harvard. I remember you'd be like, if I could just make $50 a day, yeah, then I'm just covered. Like, yeah. it's all good. Yeah. So I was trying to like, well, you should try this like pay-per-click arbitrage <laughs> Google ad stuff. We were kids. I remember you, you, you know, Google had just basically launched, mm-hmm. you know, its paid advertising program, brand new stuff. And you had taught me about um, Google AdWords and affiliate marketing. So I put an ad up promoting, I think it was the GRE uh, graduate school entrance exams. Yeah. I was promoting books that helped you do that. Yeah. And, and for the very first person who clicked one of my advertisements, the very first person also bought. So I was looking at my numbers and I was like, I spent seven cents and I made like six bucks. And this is like it. This is like, I'm, I'm a golden. And I remember that. And then, you know, the next 10,000 people, no one bought and I lost a bunch of money, you know. Um, but, but yeah, it was this, uh, you know, really fortuitous timing mm-hmm. when you were coming back and, and that exposure to uh, a, a cutting edge wave. You know, a lot of, I think, business success and stuff comes from catching the right wave mm-hmm. and then letting that wave carry you forward rather than, you know, necessarily trying to earn it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of like inflection and stuff we might talk about later, our business success was function of catching the Google wave. Yeah. That just, you know, sort us through. Yeah. Yeah. So inflection was was conceived roughly 2006. Mm. You were, you know, between your dorm room at Harvard and then coming out and staying mm-hmm. on the couch with me in Palo Alto. Mm-hmm. The insight ended yeah. up being that government <laughs> records were moving online. Right. And there were many different vectors of contact information, birth records, death records, county clerk offices moving their mm-hmm. archival, you know, databases onto the internet. And I think we had that, that thesis that anything that hasn't been digitized yet that's going digital, there's probably a lot of opportunity there. Mm. And anything that Google's not doing Mm -hmm. is is better than if they are doing it because we didn't want to compete with Google or Facebook, basically. Well, we couldn't really compete with anybody. We were just clowns, (laughs) like two 20-somethings. and and the You weren't even 20 yet. I think you were even younger than that. I might have been like 17. Yeah. Yeah, you you were 21. Yeah. 
So fast forward, you know, then we're in Palo Alto. (laughs) We've raised venture capital. We've hired teams. You've dropped out of Harvard. Yep. Devastated the parents. Totally. (laughs) Totally. I look back now and I would slap myself too. Uh, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Business was thriving. I mean, we were doing great. It was doing a half million bucks, you know, a month in revenue and it was growing and, you know, always could go back to school. So it was, uh, it was a, a wave that, you know, I think yeah. we, we could tell that we had caught a wave and, and we didn't want to miss it. Yeah, it was like, for me, you know, it it was clear from the outset that it wasn't like our heart's calling. Yeah. You know? Phone books, baby. <laughs> yeah, it was like, oh, great. We're like digitizing white pages and yellow pages online. Like, this is really what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, and there was just such a rocket ship opportunity to learn how to create a company, an organization, to learn how Silicon Valley worked, to build software, to like hire people. I mean, we were having these team meetings and it was just kind of like a dream. Like you're just seeing like all of these, like the, the action was just a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we rode, we rode the way. We decided to ride it. We thought we'd ride it for what, a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, it took a little bit longer than that. Yeah. Um, until eventually we were able to sell the, the genealogy business, archives.com in 2012. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, what a life changing, you know, experience. I mean, we were, the business was growing and stuff like that, but then there was always fear that it was going to fall apart. And, uh, and I was sleeping on your pull out couch and, and living, you know, we were quite modest in a lot of ways. And then, uh, and then ancestry bought the product for a hundred million dollars holy shit like what a transformational experience that was for a lot of our team members for our Mm -hmm. company for our lives Mm -hmm. growing up in kind of always just at that kind of poverty line always just having enough for for things to kind of shift into a a paradigm of abundance financially uh, a, with with a lot of beauty and shadow as part of that transition, it, mm. it definitely changed mm. life. It changed the, the relationship to work and, and this notion of purpose and things like that. When there isn't that gnawing dog of capitalism just always at your heels, mm. you know that that sort of opening of of a abundance and possibility within ourselves, within myself, you know, it's been a huge blessing. And, uh, and then cause all sorts of like existential questioning and probably a certain level of like mental health mm. issues because of the unbalancing and ungroundedness. I mean, I was 25 years old, mm-hmm. cashing a $25 million check. Like it's just incredibly weird and ungrounding. Mm. Um, but um, that's why I'm like grateful that it was like with you and, and with, you know, mom in our lives and everything. Otherwise I probably would have gone off the rails like Lindsay Lohan or something like that, you know? <laughs> um, but no. You you mentioned it once as as we were like a dog chasing its tail and yeah. then one day we caught it. We caught it. Oh. <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, what do we do now? Now what? Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, that really was the, 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 the opening of the portal into what has become a lot of your, your mm. work around climate, mm-hmm. um, as well as this big shift into New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd love to yeah unpack those two themes and mm. how that came about. And I really feel like, you know, we were on the journey riding together, but, you know, the, the insights around the ecological crisis mm. were something that you were really sourcing mm. at the time. You know, I remember kind of my journey was very much informed by your journey. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you were looking at, elements of like the human consciousness and the the perception of things which you know now i see are so rooted and in, in interconnected with the ecological crisis i mean there's a physical manifest ecological crisis mm-hmm. that we can see like we're chopping down the trees the oceans are, are being polluted and dying like it's right there a- and there are physical things around solar panels and wind turbines and superconductors and everything there but that also has its root in a human psychological transformation so at first I didn't see that link and was like, okay, great. You know, I'm in technology. We've got this massive problem called climate change. There's going to be a bunch of technological solutions in that realm. That's a great place to to spend my time and energy. Mm-hmm. Over time that I've kind of come all the way full circle to see that that those technical solutions 
are important, but they're equally important with a, with a change in our relationship and how we perceive our interbeing with nature and the consciousness shift, not just about you know, technologies and, and the like. Mm -hmm. And what about New Zealand? Like what we were in California, mm. we were in Silicon Valley. H how did New Zealand come about? Well, first it was just holiday. We came out and we, we went to Auckland and we had a cyclone or something like that. And it was crazy. And we came down here for a few days and really liked it. Um, then we came back and for another holiday and I think just kind of kept, you know, it's a relatively easy flight. You fall asleep in San Francisco, you wake up the, the next morning in, mm -hmm. in Auckland and, and New Zealand has such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful place. The people are so kind. It's relatively easy to be as a, a foreigner from America because it speaks English and, and a lot of similar, uh, cultures and customs. And then over time, I think it just became, it went from holiday to kind of part-time home to, to kind of place where we saw that all these technological themes around sustainability could be applied. Mm -hmm. And that being a big issue is, is often what we experienced in business was the first customer, the first big customer is always the hardest one mm -hmm. to get. Somebody's got to go out on a limb. Somebody needs to be first and show that it works. And, and the same was true about all these great ecological technology innovations, whether it's related to regenerative farming, sustainable energy, you know, uh, ecological homes, lots of smart people doing lots of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Often their biggest challenge is how do we get some big customers to anchor it, show it at scale so that then we can continue to grow and, and ramp this out. Mm -hmm. And we thought that, well, like New Zealand is a great place for that because it's relatively affluent. It's forward looking. It embraces the notion that sustainability matters and, uh, and a bunch of other themes that we could talk about of, of why I think New Zealand has an opportunity to really lead in the, the conversion of, of its economy into a sustainable and regenerative, um, impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you see New Zealand as this early adopter, first customer of a lot of the important technologies and innovations and advancements of our time, it, that that's an opportunity that New Zealand has. Absolutely. How much do you think of it as the place where these things are being birthed mm -hmm. versus adopted? I think it'll be birthed disproportionate to its population in the world, but only, you know, maybe three X its population ratios, which mm -hmm. is to say they're not that much. There right. will be a lot of innovation from around the world. I think there's more opportunity in adoption and implementation here mm -hmm. than development mm -hmm. because development often requires a lot of scale. If you want to build, you know, wind turbines or something, you're not going to do that from New Zealand. It's just not right. practical. Right. But, but, you know, whether that was ideated here, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, manufactured offshore, maybe brought back in or whole other technologies from different cultures, different ways of doing things, mm -hmm. how India deals with its uh, wastewater would probably help what New Zealand's struggling with, with its wastewater immensely. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to be built from here, I don't think. Yeah. So I've just been, you know, traveling a lot in the San Francisco area and the West Coast over the last few months. And the vibe in Silicon Valley around climate and climate tech has totally shifted from when you and I were living there. Okay. You know, all of a sudden it's like, it's in vogue, <laughs> you know, every, all the VCs are talking about it. Like it's, it's very much a thing. Mm. Whereas when we were, you know, looking around, it felt a little bit like we were crazy people. Right. Like there just wasn't a lot of discussions in the Silicon Valley vortex around climate and mm. ecology. Um, Especially for someone who comes from maybe a technology or business background like yourself, mm. you know, curious, like, what are some of your reflections having been on that journey now for almost a decade? Mm. Um, what have you learned? Well, I guess there's a lot of importance in the grassroots connection to land and place that it's very easy from a technological perspective to ignore the hillside where your wind turbine will be installed or the river where your new fancy, you know, hydro converter will be installed and finding ways that technology can be adopted to place and, and integrated into grassroots communities in places that work for them, mm -hmm. I think is really important. It's why I think like the solar panel works pretty well 
in popularity because it can be very small, one panel, and it can go in all sorts of different configurations versus like huge concentrated solar farms, while technically more efficient, uh, have to be of a certain kind of format mm -hmm. and, and can't be picked up and adopted. So I think we're, I think it seems like things that are tools rather than like roll out technology plans work better, mm -hmm. more Lego blocks. I definitely, coming from a software perspective, underestimated just how difficult physical manufacturing and, and things are uh, to compete at, at price, at scale. Mm -hmm. I think that entrepreneurs now probably need to be thinking, if, if they're doing hardware things, there's probably a lot around having major, major partnerships to help kind of ramp and scale and co-develop rather than two guys you know, doing software together. It's just a much cheaper mm. path for expansion. Mm -hmm. There's also just so much in these kind of alternative financial models now with, you know, carbon credits and biodiversities and there's going to be tax things with the Infor uh, Inflation Reduction Act. All of those things can actually help change business models. And, and that's where I would also be kind of really looking is, is what's possible now mm -hmm. that wasn't possible before uh, like one business we looked at that we didn't end up investing in was around um, AI analytics for energy efficiency. So it was like, yeah, there's been smart meters and stuff forever. That's not new, but actually putting the GPT-4 in there so that it could manage load and everything automatically mm -hmm. can save a ton of money for a big, you know, Walmart or one of these kind of big companies. Um, so there are going to be things like that that, that I would say, look at what's just now possible um, through the, the material science, the mm -hmm. biological science, and the internet computer software. All those vectors are, are really changing massively as we speak. Right. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to the, the experience of just like kind of riding a technology wave mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. in 2006 around big data and around search engines and really just being a a small player in mm -hmm. Google's massive wave. And now we're seeing multiple of these large technology waves, you mm -hmm. know, taking place or continuing to take place. Um, I want to go further into AI, but before we go there, I'm also curious, you know, with crypto, mm -hmm. it's been a, a journey. I, I remember at one point you said to me, you said, I'm not worried that it won't work. I'm worried that it'll work too well. What do you mean by that? Oh, I mean... I'm, I'm really influenced by, by the work of this author named James Tunney, uh, who's an Irish um, mystic and, and lawyer, strange combination. Mm. Um, and, you know, he wrote a book about what he calls the age of scientism, uh, the mystery of the trapped light. And, and there is this uh, trend, this force that seems to be going in our world right now of, of just this encroaching technology taking over all aspects of our lives, intermediating in our social relationships, our economy. Um, the, it's not just about like iPhone technology. This goes all the automotive and, and all our energy and everything. Like the super organism of our economy uh, transcends human control. It's not about will AI take over. Like already industrial civilization is outside the control of any people. Mm -hmm. And, and while there are influential people, you know, doing things, they're not really in control of right. this thing. And so um, I'm not sure that's a good thing. And when, when the crypto, you know, advocates come out and they're like, hey, this is great. Now we can take money and take it out of the hands of the central banks and put it in control of the almighty algorithm, you know, that none of us can control and no one can disrupt. I get why, because there's been a lot of abuse by central banks and a lot of nefarious things, but is actually the solution to that complete human disempowerment and, and essentially setting in process this distributed mode of co computation that then no one has any control over. Mm -hmm. And because it has co collective buy-in, then we can't extricate ourselves from it either. Mm -hmm. uh, Tani's also a poet and, you know, talks about the blockchain. Are we chaining ourselves to this? Mm -hmm. is, this is this something where we're going to look back in time and say, oh, you know what? Like those decades of all our really smart people and those hundreds of billions of dollars in order to 
perpetuate the notion of private property, artificial digital scarcity, and, you know, and, and indoctrinate that kind of system at this root level of the internet, which previously didn't have those paradigms? Is that what we want? Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I think programs like what you're doing and stuff are so important because it's like those things are happening anyway now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not a Luddite saying like, let's not have any blockchain stuff. But by gosh, let's let's try to do it for stuff that actually is the world we want to see, else it get frozen in place. And then we're just sitting there saying like, oh, shoot, a deflationary currency that uses up or a, a fixed currency that uses up all our electricity. <laughs> you know, no, I don't think that's a very good idea. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Yeah. And, and how about AI? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I start? I mean, it, it, it's uh, it's a phenomenal thing. It's an amazing time to be alive. I mean, we're seeing the birth of this seeming entity. I really like the the analogy of a mirror, 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 mirror on the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, that that this screen that we're looking into is this mirror for us, and so we're able to to kind of cast this spell invoke this magic words tell me something Mm -hmm. and then it mirrors it back to us you know just like the fairy tale and and it's going to show us what we want and so i think we're we're getting caught into this we're going to be caught into this really interesting reciprocal feedback loop with our technology Mm -hmm. whereas before it was pretty muted you know media makers would make stuff and produce it we would consume it they'd learn but now it's going to be instantaneous in real time Mm -hmm. And I, I don't I don't think we're at all ready for what's happening. I think we're going to be caught flat footed. Um by and when the, you say we, you mean the 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 biggest we, all of humanity. Oh well, I think you could pr- pretty much draw that circle however you want. Um <laughs> I, I certainly think at a as a human level, not even close, at an at a Western, you know, democracy, technological societies, still not ready. Mm-hmm. As a farm and as a group of people, I don't think we're ready mm-hmm. because it's gonna I think it's gonna happen really dramatically over the next 10 years in its Mm -hmm. transformational potential. But like it's going to all these bajillionaires and, you know, I mean, it's Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk's and the like. And what's unfortunate about this technological wave is it seems Mm -hmm. to be concentrating. It's not opening up a wave of, of new opportunities for small businesses and the like. It's cementing the power of the, the six, monolithic technology companies that more or less run our society now mm-hmm. and have more wealth than the governments that purport to regulate them. Mm-hmm. And and with that, you know, the AI runaway risk and everything like that, I mean, yeah, like I've heard all kinds of theories about how it could go wrong. But I'm I, like crypto, I'm more worried about it going right. Mm-hmm. I'm w- more worried about that the, the stated plans of, of these people succeed in what they're trying to do mm-hmm. and create you know, ubiquitous software that that removes the need for humans to participate in the functioning of our society and and then just puts us in a position of of you know begging for redistribution from from the central power system mm-hmm. uh, through taxation of of a small number of people who have all the money. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think that's kind of the the trend. The the be- the beautiful, you know, angle is to say that this could potentially unlock um, education and, and health and and interconnectivity for the whole world and uh, usher in an age of human flourishing. Mm-hmm. But it really is going to be dependent on the consciousness of how we deploy it. And uh, as of now, it's military and big corporates that are putting these to work. Right. So we need the conservationists and the health people and the teachers and the doulas and, and you know, all the mm-hmm. people who don't typically think of themselves in that world to grab hold of this grab the the reins of our digital society mm-hmm. pull it back from the social media networks and the the kleptocrats and and focus it on the real problems of of our society so that we can build that flourishing world and and how do we manage that tension of it's like oh cats out of the bag this is happening we need more people to be involved to maybe direct this in healthier ways but then it's kind of like the prescription ends up being a perpetuation of everyone spending more, you know, now, now do you want to go pull people from, you know, working in the humanities? Right. Like, no, we need you to go build AI. Right. right? And how, like, and and you've, I know grappled with this mm. here on the farm in the last few years of just being like, 
you know, do you just opt out? Do you mm. just kind of be like, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just done. I'm just done chasing all of this. Or do you try to stay in the game and like direct it? And yeah. How are you feeling all of that? Well, I'll, I'll shed the unpopular answer here, I guess. Um, I think it's really important to, to opt out from time to time mm. and to be done and to not hold it all. I think it, it, there's so many people, probably a lot of people who would watch a podcast like this who are in the game, who mm. are working their butts off, mm -hmm. trying to do the right thing. Our society doesn't financially re reward this kind of work. Mm -hmm. So people are often working extra hours for less pay, mm -hmm. grinding, working against the, the momentum of industrialized society. And, and it's just burnout. Mm -hmm. We see it all the time in the organizations we work with. Mm -hmm. And that incremental productivity that led to the burnout isn't worth the consequence of the burnout mm. because then everything declines. You can might get sick. You make bad decisions about the stri strategic direction of your organization. You, you just miss a and you don't love the life along the way. Right. Mm. And so then not only does it not work out there, it doesn't work, you know, in here. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think rests and, and times of, of deep disconnection are mm. imperative to maintaining good energy Right. in all these different things because if we had the answers and we didn't need inspiration from nature or from right. silence then we would just go out and do the, the thing and we'd, right. we'd be done right we need to to seek outside ourselves and and to silence the mind and, mm. and allow inspiration to come in from from the outside i think yeah and i mean you you're a polymath you know you have many different skill sets cool. and <laughs> i uh you know, I'm biased, but I respect the hell out of you and I've mm. have learned so much. But I would say one of the most magical things that I've gotten to witness is this this fairly, you know, seasonal, periodic, but it, it always feels like it comes out of the blue. Like somehow there's just this stroke of insight or this putting two very disparate things together and unlocking a whole new pathway, hmm. you know, whether it was like working with you and in inflection and like new business ideas or whether it was like strategic partnerships or whether it's, you know, just coming into a room where there's a bunch of really smart people and we're all like deep in the problem. And then you're, you just kind of see it from a new angle. Hmm. And I, I want to pull that thread a bit more because I hmm. feel like it's part of your unique genius. Hmm. What are the, the the conscious practices what is the experience like for you how do you kind of create that because i know you've you've somewhat become aware of it and cultivate mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. um yeah and if you can share more in your words yeah only more recently trying to to become intentionally aware of what i intuitively do as essentially my work mm. which i think does just boil down to to having a very simple understanding of things mm -hmm. yeah how to just get simpler and simpler and simpler mm -hmm. because if we can understand the root then we'll understand the tree but you if we go right at the tree with all its branches and all its different mm -hmm. leaves it's just it's too much information so i think it's it's like humility mixed with ambition it's like a desire it's like humil a uh, humble humil <laughs> <laughs> humble to to say like that i don't have the answer but ambitious to say, but but that I seek to understand, mm -hmm. and then uh, reflecting that through words. Typically, you know, I mean, that, I'm not like a great artist or whatever, but I'm I'm pretty fluent in speaking, and so speaking with just lots of people, mm -hmm. and and then trying to build some kind of momentum around whatever uh, wants to be mm -hmm. in in the group of people or in the business, and I think I'm pretty good at not what I would call like collapsing the wave function. So letting the thing mm. kind of emerge and then not immediately like naming it or, mm. or saying what it is, but just like seeing it and then letting it come enough to, and then creating the structure. Although usually right. I was just like, Hey, big brother, how about we create a little structure over here? Uh, <laughs> Cause that was always a, an area that you excelled. And I think mm. that back and forth was actually really what made the business and stuff work was, mm -hmm. you know, my kind of more ideation and, and creative chaos. And then, and then the, consistency and rigor that you would bring to it so that it could mm -hmm. scale mm -hmm. and and another way that you've expressed that alchemy is through your poetry and yeah. your your raps yeah, and uh i remember the first time that 
we made a debut at at an inflection holiday party yeah. uh, where we did a cover to the Gorillas. Clint Eastwood. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we rewrote all of the words, and we were just trying to do something to celebrate the team and to. Yeah, exactly. You still got it. <laughs> um, and then that launched your rap career. I quickly retired, but yeah, yeah, yeah. one and done for you. Yeah, it but, was yeah. it was a drop the mic and Off I'm out. Um, yeah, but you've you've now used poetry and yeah. and rap very intentionally, and um, and, and the way I would you know somewhat characterize it is like you're you're going into rooms, often like the context we find ourselves in are just awkward to begin with. <laughs> totally. You know, they're just like, totally. rant, like, you know, if you're in the corporate world, period, like it's just, there's a lot of like cringe moments and awkward things right. and so forth. So it's like, how do you just bring humor and lightheartedness, authenticity mm. to say what actually wants to be said mm. or what your feeling needs to be heard? Mm. Um, but then like making fun of yourself, mm -hmm. like just giving yourself permission to look like a clown and just be like really silly. Um, and it just keeps working. It just works. It, eh? just works. it just works. I mean, we've done it, you know, across inflection <laughs> and then, you know, across the, the, the journey with Edmund Hillary fellowship. And, mm. you know, just the other night you wrapped in front of the prime minister of That's New right. Zealand. That's right. Um, and uh, in many other examples. So yeah, share, share more about this part of your, your work or your expression. It's so great, hey, like to, to get to weave, you know, because I mean, even before the rap for, for the team members at Inflection, I had done one before mm -hmm. at, a, at a, a certain uh, Halloween party uh, that we may have hosted. <laughs> and uh, there was a very special girl in the audience that I wanted to impress. And uh, Right. I was very concerned because she was you know, super beautiful. She was older. And, and, and that was really the birth of, of BMO in a way. And, and as, a, as a persona, mm. uh, I often, you know, I often will go by the name BMO, mm -hmm. Brian Monahan, BMO. And um, the character helped me to bring more energy without being afraid. Mm into those settings, right? Because it was scary, like, especially at inflection of like hundreds of people, all of them older than me. And I'm going to get up and like team morale for the employees <laughs> and stuff like that. I'm like, okay. Like, right. It was very scary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I'm naturally a, a relatively shy person. Like I, I don't do a lot of social stuff in the scheme. So, um, having a persona, this notion of BMO, who was like this character, Mm -hmm. and and bimo would would be more fearless and and could could make a fool of himself more mm -hmm. and then over time it just that character just kind of i uh, just became that and that became me and and the the notion of a of a facade just mm -hmm. kind of went away and uh and now it, i almost only do poems at like most of my like speaking gigs or if i get invited or whatever i'll say a few things and then i'll mm -hmm. do the poem and and the poems are great because, like, the the flow. I can say things that I absolutely couldn't say. Right. Like, right. how do we how do we bring that depth? Well, one of the things that can be done is is to put it into art, mm -hmm. and art has this way of bypassing the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. We're also jaded, and we've all seen it all, and we're mm -hmm. blown out. So, so appealing to that, giving giving too much emphasis to that chakra of the body, mm -hmm. just doesn't seem to work as well. As as kind of just re like pre writing it and delivering so much information so quickly through the poem that it sort of just like bypasses uh, that skeptic. Nice, I love it. Yeah, it's so much fun, uh, and that I think is also the key. Is like we got to have fun in this world. There's yeah. so much, especially if you're doing work in conservation and things like that. It's just the content's often pretty bleak, mm -hmm. and so. If we if the message isn't a good news, like, but that doesn't mean we can't still uh, say it joyously right. and to exalt in in the majesty of the moment, even if that majesty is is in opposition to what we want it to be, our individual preferences, mm -hmm. we can still hold a devotional relationship to it. Mm. And is that just like a you just try and and just like continue to meditate on on seeing the joyfulness and and experiencing that, or is there kind of a frame or perspective you're holding to to kind of stay with that um, 
that joyfulness? Well, I think that is the the practice. I mean, that's the spiritual practice. It's to um, be always opening ourselves to what is, to become aware of our own personal preferences and where we're closing down and, and restricting the energy, and then where we're kind of opening up into, yeah, that, that broader appreciation, that transcendent perspective. Mm-hmm. And that's been a really important part of my life for a long time. So I, I have my own little ways that I do that mostly through Qigong practice and through silent meditation. But there's a million ways that people can find the transcendent We're running and fishing mm-hmm. or hiking or mm-hmm. reading. Like I don't promote yeah. one thing. I think everyone's got their own pathway to find it. Right. And how has it been for you to go from the, the hustle bustle of Silicon Valley mm. to now living out on a rural farm mm. in New Zealand mm. with the family around, with friends, collaborators, but we're... We're out here on Mangaroa Farms. Yeah. It's a bit of an unexpected move. And, For sure. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a bit about that, um, both the project as well as the the lifestyle for you. Yeah. Um, Mangaroa is an awesome place to live. I mean, we, we're so close to the city. The Wellington, you know, is 30 minutes from here. But you come over Wallaceville Hill from Upper Hutt, and you, you're in this pastoral um really spread out, sparsely populated area. And Mangaroa Farms is this huge farm. It's 2,000 acres and and provides so many challenges. Like <laughs> this thing has got every problem that every, you know, farm, rural village community faces, whether that's housing, food production, energy. It has all the the same problems, but in a microcosm. And so as I spoke before about that opportunity to be the first customer, to be a place for deploying um, interesting new technologies and approaches, Mm. it's the perfect fusion of that idea. Um, And then, you know, with kids, you become more attuned to the society and the culture. So like at first as a young single man, I was really interested in the energy grid and the water and the infrastructure. And now I'm really interested in the culture, the the kinds of people, the societal norms, mm. the diet, things that are going to really influence how my kids grow up. And uh, yeah, it's a full spectrum way of interacting with the world because it's it's work, but it's also home. It's also friends and community that requires some real effort in making sure that things stay balanced and not too much overloaded. But um, But yeah, the shift to New Zealand has become now full spectrum of both work and personal life, um, which, yeah, it's definitely a big shift. Which, and, and on the farm, you know, the original name of the legal entity that we oh, created yeah. was Integrated Ag, right? Yes. And the thesis was that it was going to be the integration of many disparate parts that mm-hmm. created part of the magic. Mm. You know, it wasn't just going to be really good at one thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, how does that dovetail with this idea of being kind of first customer and Mm. what are, what have you learned about that since that original thesis? Yeah, well, everything is in flow. Everything is in a, in a state of flow and moving. And so one piece, the, the very arbitrary delineations between how, what, what we name things. So this is our food production, but the food is so tied to the water. You can't call food without water. And can't really talk about water without electricity, especially here in New Zealand. Can't talk electricity without talking fossil fuels and carbon. So like all of these pieces are are interconnected. And what we're facing now as a civilization is, is, is a systems level change and a systems level jump. And so it's not just about, we'll replace the gas power plant with some solar panels and then think that that's going to solve our collective problem. Actually, we need a a whole different systems design and we don't necessarily like have like a specific answer that we're trying to promote here, but, but that's the inquiry that we're kind of always feeling into. And, and that's where these new tools kind of come together in, in emergent ways is now all of a sudden, Oh, well we can take this uh, aspect that's really good for dealing with farm manure and effluent. Uh, So like when our dairy cows poop in the shed and, when we have to do something with all that poop, well, we can actually use that to capture gas that we can use to cook our meat. And so then in this way, we can 
create these reciprocal, you know, energy loops. And, and, but if you only look at it from one lens, then you, you miss kind of how things flow in and flow out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, again, that, that we're really lucky here to get to have the scale to put some of these things to work. Right. And then in terms of the financial aspects of that, yeah. you know, cause it's like capitalism rewards mm. economies of scale. Right. It rewards specialization. Right. Um, it, it kind of rewards extra, you know, externalizing mm. a lot of things and we're kind of throwing all of those things out with the, the farm, you mm -hmm. know, we're like, we're not specializing. We're mm -hmm. trying to stack a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. Um, we're not at a huge economy of scale. We're not trying to be, um, 2000 acres still relatively modest for, you know, a lot of farms, especially mm -hmm. since a lot of it's just in, in forest. Right. And, um, you know, we're not, we don't, we're trying to internalize rather than externalize. We're mm -hmm. trying to take responsibility for stewardship of land and do a lot of things that aren't economical. So in, in that uh, frame, you know, how do we still um, find the financial pathways for this systems change that we mm -hmm. all have to go through? And what are you learning and observing about the finance side of things? Uh, that it's hard, that it's changing, that the society like society that we're interacting with is changing i mean a lot of businesses really struggled with covid mm -hmm. and actually in a lot of ways the farm became a lot stronger mm -hmm. in covid people start caring more that their food comes from a local provider and they'll be willing to put that extra effort into it so i think some of these things the enemy is like time in the near term like a lot of things have good trends behind them mm -hmm. but it just takes a long time Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably one is it's just the societal financial shift will take some time, but the trends are, are in that direction. Um, you know, carbon credits and stuff like that was a huge boom for the forestry work. I mean, we bought it, it was $2 a credit. Now it's $60 a credit. And so the, the whole economics of forestry and, and uh, reforestation and everything are completely different now. Mm -hmm. than they were before and that speaks to internalizing things that used to be externalized um and i think that ultimately you know having um i guess it's there's a theory there's a theory here that says um there is a way of social organizing that isn't based on kind of blind greed and just everyone competing against each other but also isn't like top-down hierarchical state control, mm -hmm. but has some sort of like, we're all aligned in some ways, but that there is flexibility and, and competition and, and people striving for excellence that could produce uh, excellence towards a social goal rather than just excellence towards profit extraction. Mm -hmm. And that that can be more than financially viable, it can be abundant mm -hmm. because you're not wasting so many resources on competition, right. which often, yes, does promote innovation and, and you know, consumer outcomes, but also ends up, you know, 40% of revenue in advertising budgets and <laughs> people skimping on quality because they got to compete with these people mm. and driving up input costs. And so there's all these other things that competition creates mm -hmm. other than just like capitalist efficiency mm -hmm. that, that I don't think are well, you know, understood yet. And I think that's where we're trying to go with with Mangaroa Farms is having this constellation of different enterprises, none of which are huge, but all of which mutually support each other, all of which could have sustainability within themselves, but really unlocking something when they're seen in, in holistic uh, mutuality. Right. Right. And what I love about it is it's so clear. It's like it's in service to this place, mm -hmm. this, this particular aspect of our bioregion, mm. you know, and, and so... Yeah, like when when everyone does that, mm. it isn't a competition in many mm. ways because mm -hmm. it's like, well, right. you're just in service to this place. Um, so it is a different a different paradigm and frame. Um, and I, I, I mean, there's so many different threads we can pull mm. on, and I, I'm appreciating that we're just really creating like a teaser. And now that this is all set up, I think we can have more conversations um, and go deeper in different topics. But I, I do want to touch on the philanthropic side yeah. of, of the work and so Mangaroa Farms now sits inside of Biome Trust, Biome Trust being a charitable entity. Um, and that was kind of our best effort to 
you know, make the land more like commons mm. based land, stewardship governance, um, the removal of private profit from the base layer of this of this place that is the stewarded as property mm. um, in the current you know legal and financial system. And so biome trust also is able to do some grant making or gift making into other organizations and projects. Mm. And you know we're still fairly early on this journey, but yeah, would you be up for elaborating and what are you what are you observing, thinking about in that space and any other reflections? It's so gangster. <laughs> it's so gangster. Like to get to to get to, you know, make my job giving money to awesome people doing the the important work in this world. Mm -hmm. It's just an absolute phenomenal way to spend time. I'm so grateful to get to to interact with so many amazing people. And, and be inspired all the time by their selflessness, their, their courage and their work, mm. especially a lot of people in front lines communities doing, doing the, the real work. Um, so yeah, Biome Trust, as you said, was, was created as a vehicle to be able to facilitate, you know, the, the wealth from inflection, you know, as, as that came into money and then that money is now going back out. And, um, was a really great, I think, spiritual process for us and our family to to get really clear about: Do we need more? No. Okay. How do we responsibly steward this? How do we think about the, ch the kids and future generations and parental inheritance rights? And like, there was a lot of discussions uh, mm -hmm. through that whole journey, and feel really good about how it's all ended up, and feel really stoked by the caliber of people that are gathering around it and, and the ability to do artistic service mm. through through the biome vehicle i think is just phenomenal and the, the time is calling for it so much so there's there's a lot to do mm. nice yeah yeah and i know you care most about this this final topic i want to ask you about which is being a great father oh, and yeah. your daughters you have two beautiful little girls um tell us about that journey yeah, so the two the two little ones are three and a half and about six months old now. Two girls, they're the the light of my life for sure. I think it was something you said. You said like you know having kids is like the ultimate, um, like demonstration of hope in a beautiful world. Mm. Like it's the ultimate sign of faith in in a future mm. because you kind of can't bring kids in the world if you think that we're all effed. You know, you got to think that there's something there. And, you know, Kat and I went back and forth. I mean, we're both kind of really tuned into like, oh, environmentalists will say like the number one thing you can do to protect the planet is like, don't breed. <laughs> you know, like if you look at the carbon impact of every new person, especially mm. our kids have huge carbon footprints um, just by being in the West and, and consuming the way that Westerners do. Um, so it was a really careful and intentional decision. and. Um, and then it just turned out to be the best, the best thing. Uh, it's really hard, but really beautiful. And I, I do find that now my context in in like the work and environmentalism takes on a whole different tone. Mm. Uh, I used to care about the world in the abstract. Now I care about the literal world, but not so much about my timelines as like the the longer term. So like apocalypse and stuff doesn't scare me as much as like slow degradation over centuries mm -hmm. um, and, and keeps me, I think, grounded into uh, any solution is also intergenerational. And so not being like frenetic and, and ego based and like, I got to hurry up and change the world, but rather seeing that these are deep patterns that are embedded in deep time and it will process itself out intergenerationally. and so. In that, I do have an active participatory role in in how that goes with my kids and mm. you know this generation of kids that I'm interacting with, and and everyone at home, very likely has some children somewhere in their life that they can be a part of that child's life, mm. and and in bringing that ecological awareness and and spiritual sense of like interbeing and raising good kids, um, we all have a really effective mechanism in which to interact with the world. That is probably undersold the most. I think people talk, oh, don't drive cars and eat no meat. Mm. I think like 
being be engaged in a young child's life, I think has a way more impact uh, and is way more fun. It's <laughs> more fun than not flying, you know? Mm. Yeah. 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 It's I've had this practice of reviewing like the the highlights or lowlights of my day. And yeah, since yeah. Aurora arrived, it was just like consistently like, oh, the highlight of my day is interacting with her mm. consistently, even in the most random context, surpassing moments. And mm. like, isn't that interesting how so much joy can can happen with young children? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And it's it's available to all of us, you know, that way of seeing the world. And that to me has been the big practice and learning is I'm like, how do I find that? How do I get out of my head and into my heart mm. so that I can be with her? you know, joyously mm. instead of like, well, but I got to think about all these things. <laughs> She's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She, she does ask why a lot right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Why? 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 <laughs> why? why? Other, other reflections or closing comments you like to share, Bimo? Oh man. Um, well, I'm, I'm stoked, you know, that we're kicking off season two, popular <laughs> demand. Um, I, I, it's been really cool to see this whole thing mm. come together and uh, and not just the initial, you know, series of videos, but the system by which videos can be created. And and I know that a system like this is going to be really effective um, if it knows what to create and like what the right media is. Mm. So I, I would really encourage anyone who's listening, any audience members to please give feedback. Mm -hmm to please you know write comments share notes on the social media to to like and subscribe um <laughs> because i know that that is an important signal and and there mm. you know it feels a little weird like we're all just in a you know a garage in new zealand right now and whoever's listening to this is somewhere very far away mm -hmm. and so it's a little weird to know like if you were in the room with us right now we could right. talk and we could learn and like we'd get better at what we're saying right but we're kind of just screaming into the void Mm. And so I, I, I imagine it'd be really helpful to hear pingbacks from from the audience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We are hungry for feedback. <laughs> um, it has been an act of faith that there's there's a there there in these inquiries, and that having a um, an active conversation and communications platform mm. for many different voices to be um, shared and heard and seen. You know this this whole through line of independent media that is mm. afforded by the internet right now. Mm. It, to me, it's like one of the the last bastions of um, kind of uncensored content that's possible. Mm. Even though you know the walls are are increasingly you know encroaching uh, a bit in that. Mm -hmm. And um, so yeah, like excited to create kind of a network and a channel and conversations and get it flowing bring on new hosts and, you know, just take on different formats and really create these, like you said, repeatable systems and infrastructures so that um, some of the the production side of things can get abstracted away and that we can let the, um, yeah, the voices rise and the content sing. Sweet. Well, I'm, I'm planning on doing a ton of interviews in here. It's a little weird to be on this side of the, uh, the mic, so I'm looking forward to also switching these roles. I think at some point someone's got to interview the interviewer yeah so i can't wait there's no one else i'd rather uh be on the journey with and yeah thanks for all your support as we've been birthing this project up and it yeah it's just felt so good to have you having our backs and uh in solidarity can't wait to see what the future brings brother bimo i love you so much all right boom <laughs> <laughs> all right well you, uh, you've given us a teaser so yeah. now you have to actually deliver some some lines so maybe maybe you can do a little rap while we're on camera here i'd love to yeah so i was i was thinking about this this morning uh you know i've got a lot of pieces that have different contexts and and the like but one that i've never shared on camera mm. is actually one of the oldest ones that i wrote and i wrote this I was 17 18 years old and it was about this, this notion of how poetry and spoken word can affect our collective predicament mm. and, and how we can use it as a tool of manifestation into the world. So this flat, and then I, I've only performed it, I think, in a group maybe once or twice. Once was at the San Quentin State Prison, mm -hmm. where you and I went for a restorative justice circle. <laughs> and then afterwards, I sat with the the guys and or stood with the guys, and they were all rapping. And then I jumped in with with this verse, 
Uh, I was completely out of my league. Um, so it was it's called hip hop. So hip hop is a weapon from the future. Rhythm and rhymes are the new peaceful bullets of our times. We're at the doorstep of revolution, giving birth to the earth that we decide. Because the poetry and bass lines transcend race lines, spread community and unity and good vibes. And it's time for us to stop living the lie or our picture-perfect planet Mother Gaia will die. And besides, I just can't take, can't tolerate all these takers' t t t tongues tied with lies. Simplistic and sadistic, they're just a product of the system. I call it musical oppression. They lack the soul, wit, and wisdom. This hip-hop tradition has been hijacked, perverted, and converted into some gangster rap that's more about your gat and your fitted hat when in fact, it could be so much more than that because hip-hop is the weapon of the future rhythm and rhymes are the peaceful bullets of our times we're at the doorstep of revolution giving birth to the earth that we decide all right i hope you enjoyed that discussion with bimo you know we are making this up as we go but i'm trying to convince him to host some shows on ma earth let us know what you think in the comments below. You can learn more about Mangaroa Farms at mangaroa.org, uh, Biome Trust at biometrust.earth, and come join our community Discord to engage further in the conversations. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.